Okay. Um, well, wow. buckle your seatbelt um, because I think this next thing is probably going to shake some of your thinking. Um, if you guys want to be uh, provoked, one of the most provocative books you can read uh, is by uh, a gentleman by the name of Charles Murray called, uh, I think it's called Breaking Apart. Anyways, it's, it's basically a study on sociology. And uh, there's a guy, a younger version, named Rob Henderson, who I randomly met on the internet a few years ago. And Rob's story is pretty incredible. This is a guy that had a drug-addicted mother. He bounced around foster care his whole life. He uh, dropped out of high school, I think. He joined the Air Force, left the Air Force, and then went to Yale, and then got a PhD from Cambridge. Um, but he has had an incredibly hard life, but is an incredibly happy, kind, thoughtful human who's pretty introspective about um, just society and sociology and people. Um, if you don't have a chance to follow Rob on Twitter, I highly encourage you to do it. He's got an incredible um, newsletter. Um, it's just fascinating stuff about human psychology. And uh, he's going to give us a little presentation, and then we're going to have a conversation. So Rob Henderson, everybody. <laughs> I did graduate high school, 2.2 uh, GPA, bottom third of my class. Uh, <laughs> so I've, uh, I've been developing this framework of luxury beliefs for uh, a couple of years now. Uh, so we'll just jump right in. We'll start with, uh, with a puzzle. What do top hats have in common with defunding the police or romanticizing unmarried parenting or divorce or promoting careerism over attentive care for children and family? Uh, before we get into it, uh, Chamath told you a bit about my unusual background. I was born here in Los Angeles. I grew up in foster homes here in LA and all around California. Uh, I fled as soon as I could, uh, enlisting in the military when I was 17, and then later attended Yale on the GI Bill and, and a PhD from University of Cambridge. And throughout, uh, well, well, Yale was a very different environment for me. I learned at Yale that there are more uh, students from families in the top 1% of the income scale than the entire bottom 60%. And some of those personal experiences, along with my sort of academic research, uh, led me to uh, a discovery, which is that luxury beliefs uh, have, to a large extent, uh, replaced luxury goods. Luxury beliefs are ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class while often inflicting costs on the lower classes. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that luxury goods no longer signify status. Uh, rather, I'm making the point that luxury goods have become a noisier indicator of status. Uh, and as a result, luxury beliefs have uh, arisen. And as we'll, as we'll see later, uh, a core feature of a luxury belief is that the believer is comfortably insulated from the consequences of his or her belief. So there are multiple components to this luxury belief idea. But it starts with uh, Thorsten Veblen. He was an economist and sociologist in the late 19th century, and in 1899, he published a book called The Theory of the Leisure Class. Uh, and one of the core insights of this book is that because we can't be certain about the financial status of other people, uh, a good way to size up their means is to see whether they could afford uh, expensive uh, and costly goods. So in Babylon's day, this, these were things like tuxedos and top hats and evening gowns, pocket watches and monocles, uh, partaking in expensive leisurely activities like golf or beagling, uh, attending uh, expensive and, and lavish events, kind of like, oh. Um, <laughs> so, there's a, there's a great uh, a line in this book. Uh, uh, Veblen, uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, uh, suggests that even, even butlers are status symbols. He writes that the, the chief use of servants is the evidence they afford of the master's ability to pay. Um, so these findings were later echoed a few decades later uh, by the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu uh, in a classic uh, work in sociology called Distinction, a Social Critique of the Judgment of Taste. And this, uh, in this book, Pierre Bourdieu coined this term cultural capital. Uh, and the idea was that uh, the upper segment of society would convert their material resources into uh, 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 
avenues to express and, and perform uh, social class through what he called the dispositions of mind and body, uh, uh, developing intricate and expensive tastes, uh, knowledge of, of uh, wine and art and other rarefied cultural domains, uh, taste customs, opinions, habits. He used this term, distance from necessity. Uh, in other words, only people who did not work blue collar jobs, manual labor, could afford to invest the time and the resources uh, into performing uh, uh, the class mannerisms of that top segment. So one of the points that Pierre, uh, Pierre Bourdieu and Veblen made was that in order for a symbol, a status symbol to signify status, uh, it has to be rare, it has to be exclusive, difficult to obtain, costly to purchase. Once a status symbol is freely available to the masses, uh, the elites will subsequently abandon it. So there are historical examples of this. Uh, one that I like uh, here, the, in the Middle Ages in Europe, spi spices were difficult to obtain and costly to purchase, only the elites could afford them. But as European societies colonized India and the Americas and other regions of the globe, the cost of spices subsequently declined and uh, the mass public commoners in Europe were able to obtain spices. And in response, many European elites decided that spices were vulgar. And uh, under the reign of Louis XIV, court chefs banned sugar and spice from all meals except for desserts. Um, there's another example here, uh, dueling in the American colony. So dueling was initially uh, a, a practice primarily uh, engaged in by aristocrats. It was, uh, a, you know, it, was, it was something that only gentlemen partook in for honor. Uh, famously, one of America's founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, was killed in a duel against Aaron Burr. Uh, but gradually, this practice that was initially confined to the elite spread uh, throughout the colonies and as a result, uh, the elites abandoned this practice and then it was subsequently outlawed in the late 19th century. So distinction uh, is the key motive here. Now a couple of years ago there was a great book uh, by the author Michael Knox Barron called Wasps, The Splendors and Miseries of an American Aristocracy. And in this book, Barron writes about white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. So this was the American ruling class from roughly the mid 19th to the mid 20th centuries. And Barron points out that wasps had mixed feelings about their fellow Americans. Uh, he writes that many wasps viewed ordinary Americans as sunk in moronic darkness, and he writes that it is a question whether a high wasp ever supported a fashionable cause without some secret knowledge that the cause was abhorred by the vulgarians. Uh, in other words, many wasps would support certain movements and causes and express certain beliefs uh, because they were so at odds with conventional opinion and it made them look sophisticated and interesting and it allowed them to distance themselves from the commoners. <laughs> Um, and so sometimes when I talk about luxury beliefs, when I talk about status, people will say, Rob, is it really true that elites care so much about status? Is it really something that's so important to them? And the answer is yes. Um, the sociologist Emil Durkheim understood this when he wrote, the more one has, the more one wants, since satisfactions received only stimulate instead of filling needs. And this is supported by two recent studies, both published in 2020 by two independent groups of researchers. This is a replicated finding. Uh, the result was that relative to lower status individuals, higher status individuals have the strongest desire for wealth and status. So these researchers collected uh, objective measures of status, things like uh, socioeconomic status, level of income, occupational prestige, uh, educational attainment and found that people who were at or near the top of these measures were the most likely to agree with statements like, it would please me to be in a position of power over others, I enjoy having influence over those around me, and similar uh, statements involving wealth as well. So this is something uh, that, that's important to understand, the strong desire for status, the strong desire for distinction. So that's one component of luxury beliefs. The other is that this top segment of society also wields disproportionate influence over culture and over policy. There was a study in 2014 that received a lot of attention which found that strong support from high-income Americans doubles the likelihood that a policy will be adopted. So these are Americans in the top income decile, roughly people who earn $177,000 or more per year. Uh, this group wields a lot of influence. But it's important to understand that this group um, is often insulated from uh, the detrimental effects of some of their policy preferences if the outcomes uh, do not, are, are not favorable. Um, so this is important too. They're insulated from, from the consequences of their preferences. So what is an example of a luxury belief? Well, in 2020, the defund of the police movement gained a lot of momentum, uh, and in early 2021, YouGov uh, ran a survey, they collected data from a representative sample of Americans and found that the, well, they found overall Americans were very much against defunding the police. 
But when they broke down the results by income category, they found that the highest income Americans were by far the most supportive of defunding the police. There was another survey of, of just Democratic voters and found that white Democrats were far more supportive of defunding the police than black and Hispanic Democrats. Uh, and so as a result, despite the fact that most people didn't want this, uh, many cities across the US subsequently reduced spending for police departments uh, here in LA, in New York, Chicago, Seattle, and, and many other cities as well. And this has contributed to the violent crime wave that we've seen over the last couple of years. So these are figures from the US Census Bureau, Bureau before 2020. Um, which helps to understand who are the primary victims of crime. So in the US, relative to those who earn $75,000 or more per year, the poorest Americans are seven times more likely to be victims of robbery, seven times more likely to be victims of ag aggravated assault, and 20 times more likely to be victims of sexual assault. Um, and again, this is before 2020. If anything, these differences are probably more pronounced. Uh, so it's important here to understand that, uh, that, that to not stop crime is to actually victimize uh, the poor. This is luxury belief. Here's another luxury belief. Torching your own social capital. Over the last couple of years, it's become trendy among cultural elites to uh, uh, promote this idea of burning bridges, social ties over disagreements, over social or political views. And if you're an upper, upper middle class person, if you're highly educated, uh, geographically mobile, uh, in all likelihood, you can probably afford to burn a lot of social bridges, and in all likelihood, you'll be just fine. But if you're a person who lives at or near the margins of society, uh, it would be uh, unwise to burn your relationships with friends, families, employers, colleagues, neighbors, and so on. And so expressing this luxury belief may make you look dedicated to your cause of choice, uh, but if this belief uh, spreads throughout society, um, this would, this would uh, have detrimental effects for uh, people who are less fortunate. But for me, the luxury belief that has had the most wide-ranging uh, societal consequences uh, has been uh, the denigration of the two-parent family. So here are a couple of headlines. Uh, let's call the whole thing off. The author is ending her marriage. Isn't it time you did the same? Uh, and the nuclear family is no longer the norm. Good. By the way, I don't, I don't mean to pick on the New York Times here. I've written there, and I've had friends who have written there, but, but these are headlines that many cultural elites, these are ideas that cultural elites believe should be introduced into society among the educated public uh, to be implemented uh, into culture and into policy. So the erosion of the family structure. So in, uh, in 1960, 95% of American children, regardless of social class, were uh, raised by both of their parents. Uh, and for the upper class, for the upper 20% of Americans, uh, it dropped slightly by 2005 to 85%. So it was 95% dropped slightly to 85%. For poor and working class Americans, those in the bottom 30%, it was 95% in 1960 and it plummeted to 30% by 2005. Uh, now if you visit working class, blue collar communities in the US, it is an anomaly to see children raised by both of their parents. Um, where I grew up, I had five close friends in high school and of the six of us, none of us were raised by both of our parents. There was me raised in foster homes. I had two friends raised by single moms, one friend raised by a single dad. I had another friend who was raised by his grandmother because his mom was addicted to drugs and his dad was in prison. That is a pretty common snapshot of like what uh, neighborhoods look like uh, in poor and working class communities now. Now, there's an element of duplicity here for this luxury belief and some others as well, which is when you ask college graduates about their opinions on family formation and family structure, um, only a minority, only 25% of college graduates think couples should be married before having kids. That's what they say. Um, in other words, 75% of college graduates either hold a neutral position or think that uh, maybe they, they shouldn't be married before having kids. But then what do they actually do? Well, the vast majority of children born to college graduates are raised uh, by two married parents. Uh, only about one in 10 children uh, born to a, a college-educated mother is born out of wedlock. Uh, so there's this mismatch between words and deeds. And here you can see uh, the sort of shocking rise in out-of-wedlock births. And this is primarily concentrated, again, among the poor and the working class. It continues to rise so up until about 1920. It was below 5%. It's skyrocketed since 1960. It continues to climb. So we're, we're in unforeseen territory now where children in impoverished environments who could stand to benefit the most from two attentive parents are the least likely uh, to have them. And sometimes when I talk about the issue of the family, people uh, want to discuss the economics of this. 
Uh, there was a study a few years ago which found that if you wanted to equalize life outcomes for children raised in single parent homes, uh, this uh, would require a dis uh, redistribution of $59,000 a year to single parents to equalize educational and occupational outcomes for uh, children to match those of, of two parent uh, families. And I think this is an interesting study, and I think uh, economics shouldn't be downplayed, but I think it does uh, highlight the sort of narrow way that many elites think about family. Um, one way to think about this is if you were to ask a child who has two attentive parents, hey, we're going to take one of your parents away, but it's okay because we're going to give you $59,000 a year, <laughs> I think very few kids would accept that deal. Um, there's more to life than just educational, occupational outcomes. Uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a blind spot here about the social and emotional penalties children receive when they don't have uh, two parents available. Um, so wrapping up here, um, luxury beliefs are the new status symbols, ideas, movements, causes. Um, Pierre Bourdieu, in another one of his great books, The Forms of Capital, wrote, the best measure of cultural capital is undoubtedly the amount of time devoted to acquiring it. Uh, so only through the, the process of going to an expensive university, lis listening to the right podcasts, reading the right books, being immersed in the right environments, knowing that you're supposed to say unhoused instead of homeless, you know, the, the updating your vocabulary, these are ways for you to signify I'm a member of this upper segment of uh, society. Um, in an interview a couple of years ago, the NYU professor Scott Galloway uh, said the strongest brand in the world is not Apple. The strongest brands are MIT, Oxford, and Stanford. Academics decided we're no longer public servants, we're luxury goods. These are the places where luxury beliefs are birthed. People pay money, they, they convert their economic capital into cultural capital, they learn the right opinions to express in these institutions. Uh, but again, luxury belief holders are often insulated from the consequences of their beliefs. So, as costly as these beliefs are to obtain for the affluent, in terms of downstream consequences, they're even more costly for everyone else. And I'll leave it at that. Pre-order my book. Thank you. You ended with something that um, is, is something that's very important to me that I, that I talked to you about before, which is um, the destruction of the nuclear family and the impact that it's had on U.S. society. Um, I think it's important to just expand a little bit more, and I'll give you this provocative lead-in, which is talk about, you know, maybe LBJ and the Great Society and the War on Poverty, and, you know, there's a very famous website, what the fuck happened in 1971.com, like all of this stuff. Just, just discuss that again maybe in a little bit more detail for us. Well, yeah, I mean, there has been a, a sort of this, this backfiring effect, I think. Um, we, we, dis we, we focus a lot, we concentrate a lot on the economic circumstances of, of families and how this may contribute to deprivation, dysfunction, negative outcomes for kids. But um, one thing that I've learned through reading a lot of developmental and evolutionary psychology research, some of the things that I write about, is that childhood instability is, is worse uh, than childhood poverty for uh, uh, future outcomes. Uh, so in terms of criminality or educational attainment, um, growing up in a very unstable environment is actually worse uh, than, than um, uh, impoverishment. And even when you control for income, um, instability is still uh, strongly associated with negative outcomes for kids. In other words, a kid who's raised uh, by uh, a rich family, but say there's a lot of divorce and addiction and a lot of uh, uh, trauma in, in that family environment, uh, that kid will grow up to, to most likely have uh, worse outcomes than a kid who's raised in a poor family with two parents who uh, prioritize attentive care and stability. Uh, and so I think, we, yeah, we, we retreat to discussions of economics because no one wants to talk about values, no one wants to talk about family anymore. And I think the Great Society was kind of an example of this, of, oh, we're going to solve this all through economics, it's this kind of vulgar materialism uh, when you know, now we're seeing the, the sort of uh, downstream consequences since, since the late 60s. Yeah, I mean, the, the data point that, that may be shocking for some people is in you know, black families, as an example, the economic incentive to not get married um, on uh, you know, today dollar-adjusted basis was uh, like 92,000 to a black woman to not get married and have a child. Um, Explain what that means. How that meaning like, you know, Lyndon Johnson's welfare movement was about uplifting a lot of people, but unfortunately it created these uh, deep negative consequences that took years to build up at, through economics, through economic incentives. It was paying you to not be married. And so what, what happened? People didn't get married. And so it started to create these effects that have been compounding. And, and again, in this weird way in which we work, if you have the right label, you know, like, for example, Freeburg has made this 
statement, but like, you know, we can't talk about how bad the Inflation Reduction Act is, is because it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. Framing. Same way at LBJ, you know, it was, this was the war on poverty. And so all of a sudden you sounded like some, you know, um, insensitive Luddite if you're like, well, I'm against the war on poverty. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> who, who would be against that? So we never really had a chance to talk about it. Um, you know, Graham Allison actually had some points about this yesterday as well, well when we were yeah, talking. The one we've talked about, about Rob, is um, the framing of um, people who are homeless versus people who are addicted to drugs. You know, in, in this sort of, why would you arrest somebody who is homeless and who is, and, and they actually have a home and they're choosing to live on the street and, and they have resources and we pay for this in San Francisco. And the, the, the issue here, I think, is in framing and incentives because you actually get paid to come to San Francisco where we also have the lowest cost of deadly fentanyl. Uh, yeah, I think there's, there's a kind of a, a misunderstanding of how uh, relationships and, and societies often work. Often material prosperity coincides with no longer needing to build relationships anymore, or it uh, 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 sort of redirects uh, the incentive structure such that you, you no longer want to work or do certain things anymore. Um, I mean, it's funny, when I, when I talk to sort of more affluent Americans and, and you know, I talk to them about what's going on with uh, the, the sort of what, the underclass in, in the US. They'll suggest that a lot of these uh, problems, a lot of these communities are afflicted by, by poverty. But then when I travel to developing countries, uh, non-industrialized countries, poor countries, and, and I talk to them about what's going on in the States, they say that it's because America is too rich. That's the problem. You, know, you don't need to build relationships anymore. And often if you visit, I mean, I was in, I was in Malaysia recently, and the, you know, the, 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 the poor neighborhoods there are, you know, they're, they're far different than the poor neighborhoods that, that I grew up in, in terms of just sort of material um, uh, scarcity. And yet, um, people know their neighbors, they get married, they take care of their f family and their friends, and a lot of this is because, uh, you know, in, in America, even if you're poor, you're, the material prosperity is relatively higher than a lot of other countries, and therefore you no longer need to build relationships quite as much as, as you used to. Um, there was a line in The New Yorker a couple of years ago, uh, sort of, this, this was a profile piece on poverty in America, but one line that stood out to me was that um, you know, before the Great Society, being poor meant being hungry, and now being poor means being on food stamps, which isn't a pleasant thing to be on food stamps, but it no longer means that you're actually starving the way that you would in the past. So material prosperity and inequality mean something different now. Where does society go at the limit of all of this? Yeah, I think one thing that we could do is... Um, so, so Melissa Kearney, she's a professor of economics at the University of Maryland. She just released a book called The Two-Parent Privilege, and she points out a lot of the sort of the economic issues, and I think that's, you know, it's, it's fine, but I, again, I think that's kind of a, a narrow-minded way of looking at this. But one thing that she points out that I really like is that elites could do sort of more to, to promote values, to sort of what, uh, uh, preach what you practice. Uh, there are ways that we could just speak more about this. I think a lot, of, a lot of people who agree with a lot of my writing and the things that I say, they're reluctant to express this publicly. And it's kind of, you know, one reason why they like me is because I'll say it, but I think uh, you, one, one sort of obligation or duty you have if you are a fortunate member of society is to accept that you may take some slings and arrows for promoting values that you know are good. Um, you know, if you've lived a fortunate life, um, that, yeah, there's, there's that kind of noblesse oblige that I think that we've, we've so if, lost. If, if there's a message to folks here about how we should be telling other people, what some of those high-level values are, what would you tell us to be promoting more that we don't? I mean, I think, yeah, uh, uh, marriage, attentive care for, for children, um, I think that, that, is, that is a big one. Um, I mean, it's really interesting. When I talk about uh, marriage, a lot of people immediately pivot and they say, well, are you saying that it's bad to be a single parent or are you trying to, what, denigrate single moms? And this seems to be the only domain where people make the suggestion. If, if you say we should, we should applaud college graduates, no one ever says, oh, does that mean we're insulting people who didn't go to college? Is that what you're saying? And no, that's not what we're saying. You can, you can praise one thing and confer status on, on an activity and that doesn't necessarily imply that you're trying to denigrate everyone else. Um, so I think this is something that we could do, focus more on sort of family, uh, uh, early uh, development issues uh, for, for young kids. Um, again, childhood instability is a far greater predictor than poverty, and yet we, sp we spend so much time talking about economics. Um, where do you put some of these social movements that, you know, um, now take up and occupy a, a lot of space in society, um, where do those fit in in this construct of yours? Yeah, a lot of the movements. Cancel culture, you know, 
trans, et cetera? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you bucket sort all that stuff? I mean, a lot of that is, those are, many of them are luxury beliefs. Um, if you look at data uh, in terms of, so, so self-censorship is one that I've, that I've uh, been, been writing about and concentrating on. If you look at the data for Americans who report self-censoring for fear of uh, damaging their employment prospects or getting fired, um, it actually increases the more educational attainment someone has. So for people who, uh, the, the highest level of education is a high school diploma, about 25% of Americans say that they self-censor, um, whereas for people with college graduate, or for, for college degree, it's 33%, and then for people with postgraduate degrees, it's 44%. Well, because they have more to lose, and yeah. they know, uh, and yeah. they can anticipate what's going to happen. Right, because, because cancel culture and all of these things I mean, are actually worse. We right? had this so. conversation with Vivek on the podcast where I asked him, because he's been very outspoken about his religious beliefs, and I asked him a two-part question. Do you think there's anything wrong with being gay? And then, no, and then, hey, what do you think of trans? And, and the fact that trans issues have become such a prominent issue in this election mm. when it affects such a small number of people it is perplexing. Well, I think, yeah, moral movements often become intertwined with, with status. So for a long time, there's the gay marriage issue. And because, you know, I, 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 I cited that uh, the book on wasps, you know, uh, if, if a cause is abhorred by the Bulgarians, you know. And, and so for a long time, that was the case with, with gay marriage. But then once a, a, a great, you know, a majority of Americans supported this cause, I think a lot of highly educated uh, activists decided to move on to this next issue. And so there's, there's just kind of, you know, and any, any time an opinion is at odds with conventional opinion, it becomes more more enticing to, to promote because it signifies that you're not a commoner. Is that because of social media and is it waning? Some of it is, I think, because of social media. Um, social media scales, um, right? Uh, you, you, know, you, you, can't, uh, you can't punch a thousand people in the face at once, but you can get a thousand people to attack one person online all yes. at the same time and damage their reputation. Uh, so I think that does have uh, something to do with it. So people become afraid of expressing certain opinions. Um, but, but is it, I mean, I don't, I don't think that it's going to, ch I think we're, we're sort of, we, we are seeing a bit of a, when, you know, some people call it the vibe shift, it's, it's slowly changing. People are speaking more openly and, and criticizing cancel culture more. Um, but I think part of the reason why it's dying is because a lot of people have already been canceled. Uh, you know, well, and it's also exhausting. You know, it's like, really, <laughs> we're, we're going to attack another person because their beliefs are slightly different. And I think it's one of the things we've tried to do on the, on the podcast is say, hey, let, let's just have a conversation about these issues mm -hmm. um, and, and be thoughtful about it. And we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but we do need to talk about some of these things in an intellectually honest way, whether it's homeless, whether it's Black Lives Matter, January 6th, whatever. We try to have an intellectually rigorous, open-minded discussion. And it feels to me like that has started to tip over. I, I, I see it very distinctly that you, you can only you know, be canceled for your opinion if you allow them to cancel you. Mm -hmm. well, I think momentum is such that you try something for long enough when it eventually doesn't work, you try something else. I think society has a resilient way of just doing that. And so maybe people are realizing that cancel culture will not solve the problems that they care about. I, I think it's well and, said. And, and there has to be a different way. Robin, yeah. in, in the developed world, does the rise of luxury beliefs give rise to the populist movements. Um, I remember I would travel in the Midwest a lot. I work with farmers in rural communities. I would go out to these rural communities. I'd meet with farmers. And there was always ridicule about how Californians were arguing about the gender sign on bathrooms when their local conversation was, can I make money this year? And I hate being dependent on the government. And I would hear this everywhere I would go in rural communities in the US. And I was like, Donald Trump's going to win. <laughs> I mean, he's just, he is the voice of this group. Um, but it seemed to me that that is what really triggered the sentiment for populism. It's not just about not having enough money, but it's about seeing the inanity in some, the, view, the perceived inanity mm -hmm. of um, these luxury beliefs uh, from a group that, that isn't afforded that luxury. Yeah, well, I think a lot of working class people can sense that you know, many Many members of that elite segment of society don't really have their best interests in mind. They can see sort of, it's, it's not even just that they don't share your values, they're sort of intentionally promoting values that could undermine your, your, your communities and there's that kind of disdain. Um, and so, yeah, it's, yeah, just briefly returning, I think even, even social media may actually be contributing to some extent. I mean, now people can go online and just see how, um, yeah, how, how 
mentally limited a lot of elites are, uh, just by looking at their Twitter profiles or the things that they say, things that they write about, whatever um, uh, expressions that they have online. And I think this is also sort of, uh, you know, sort of behind the curtain moment of, the wow, that's, has that's no exactly, this is like that. that. This is who's leading the country. This is, uh, or this is who, who leads the most prestigious institutions. Uh, and so, yeah, I think there is a, there, there's a bit of that uh, can as you, well. Can you talk about a little bit, um, just back to family and marriage for a second. You wrote something about, um, you know, large numbers of sexual partners, a sort of dating culture, the hookup culture. Can you just tie those two things together? And one observation that I had, and maybe it was because I read your stuff, I then noticed that there seems to be these small green shoots of people who are being celebrated from getting married quite early. Now, they tend to be stars, but there is this interesting trend. Uh, and I thought, wow, this could be one of these things where you're now starting to model a very different set of choices when you're 23 and 24, where, you know, Nobody would have thought today you would get married at 23, And this obsession with matchmaking and maybe a better way than swiping right would be to be thoughtful about uh, yeah. the values your partner has. Yeah. yeah, I think there is an element of status here. I mean, when Tinder and a lot of the dating apps took off in around 2012, uh, in 2012, most Americans didn't uh, have, have cell phones yet, or, or, or smartphones rather. Uh, but then you know, now that everyone has a smartphone and now that everyone's on the dating apps, it has lost a bit of that uh, exclusivity, a lot of that sort of signifier of, of status. And I think this is one reason why we're seeing a lot of, a lot of affluent people sort of uh, shift back to trying to meet online. Um, or, or rather in person, um, to meet in person. Um, and yeah, I think uh, promiscuity, all of these things. I, I had a friend um, a couple of years ago who, you know, he told me, uh, you know, Rob, when I, so, so he was a student at, a, at, a, at an elite university, and he said, when I set my uh, uh, dating app radius to one mile, just, just right, out, right around the university, um, you know, most of the, the female profiles, he saw these were fellow students, and he said something like a third of them in the bios, they said, you know, I'm, you know, poly or, or casual or not looking for anything serious. And then when he extended the radius uh, to the outskirts of the university, which is a more sort of blue collar area, uh, same age range, you know, what, you know uh, what was it, 20 to 24 year old women or something, he said that uh, the majority of the women he saw were single moms. Uh, and so sexual promiscuity looks very different depending on uh, your social class, how much money you come from and, and so on. Um, okay. Uh, we need to wrap. You can follow Rob Henderson on uh, Twitter and sign up to his Substack. Uh, newsletter, Substack, yeah. Well done, Rob. Thank All you, right. Rob. Thanks again. Thanks, Come on. David, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rob. Well done. Thank, thank you. Thank you. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sachs.